Hey guys, uh, Jacob Merrick here from Introvert Travels. And a few weeks ago, I had posed a question out there for people to ask me anything about travel or the travel industry and to let me have your questions. And I would do my best to answer and give you my opinion um, or my advice on certain questions. So um, in that vein, I'm gonna answer some of the questions that people have thrown out there. And as you're watching this video or if you're watching the recording, if you have any other questions, um, just let me have them here and I will um, make another video and continue to answer any questions that you guys might have. So Lucas says, uh, or Lucas asks, people always talk about the best, how the best part of traveling is meeting local people and how nice they are. How the heck does that work if you're introverted? Great question, because that's something that I actually run into all the time. And I don't know if there's any like right or wrong answer for this. And unfortunately, the truth is probably not what you want to hear. <laughs> um, I do think that uh, it takes a certain amount of effort to be able to sort of become extroverted temporarily if you're looking to um, meet other people. I will say, though, that having spent the last four months down here in South America has been incredible. And I've met a lot of fascinating people, people who are extremely well-traveled, who I would love to continue keeping in touch with or to explore more around Peru, um, which is actually where I am right now. You can see in the back, <laughs> this is the Sacred Valley of Peru. Um, I find that just naturally traveling with uh, in, in areas that you're interested in, you're going to meet like-minded people as well. And so you're probably going to run into people that you have something in common with just, just by the very nature of travel. It's kind of a social type of thing. Um, and then I will also say that by doing small group tours, um, I think there's a stigma against small group tours, but they're actually fantastic ways to meet like-minded people. So um, kind of the, the newer style of group travel is small groups of, say, like 15 or 16 people maximum, and usually less. So they probably average out to be around 10 or 12 people. So it's not so overwhelming for introverts that you can't like have some alone time. But like I said, it's a great way to meet people who have um, like-minded uh, travel priorities as you would. So that's kind of my advice for meeting people when you're actually on the road for an introvert. Um, it's not always such a cut and dry issue. It's not always super easy, but um, just by its very nature of doing the types of activities and traveling to the places that you uh, love or that you're interested in will be a great way to um, meet other people. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Um, Erin asks, she says, she says, any tips for maximizing the sometimes very limited time that you can spend traveling? Erin is self-employed. She um, finds it difficult to travel for long periods of time with her and her fiance. And I totally get that. So um, one of the ways that I would recommend doing this is to maximize your vacation time by maximizing weekends and holidays. You might pay a little bit of extra money in terms of like um, peak holidays for certain destinations, but you're going to maximize your time away from home if you're able to capitalize on bookending um, with weekends and or holidays. Those are going to be like your biggest tricks for maximizing your time. And I will also say, um, I know, Aaron, you live in Seattle, and this can go for um, people who live in any sort of major um, air airport market. Um, like I'm in Miami, so it's very convenient for um, Latin America. If you're in Seattle, you can get very easily to Asia. If you're in LA or New York, you're lucky because you can get anywhere you want. Um, Minneapolis, Chicago are great gate gateways to Europe. Um, Iceland is huge right now too. So finding those places that are just a hop, skip, and a jump away from your local airport is going to also really maximize your time on the ground rather than spending time transferring in airports or huge long haul flights. Um, Susan just asks um, on the live video right now, she says, how does an introvert get over traveling to other countries when they don't speak their language? That's a great question. And uh, one of my favorite tools is actually Google Translate. Um, they have a new app that you can download. Um, it's not a new app, but new features where you can actually translate live. You can translate signs, menus, and if I'm communicating with, say, a taxi driver and I don't speak the language, you can actually type or or voice into the app and then it will spit out the translation for your local person to understand um, verbally what you're trying to communicate. So if you need to get to your hotel, put that into the app and then let the app speak that, uh, that other language to your cab driver or to whoever it is that you're talking to. So um, I love the Google Translate app, Google Translator app um, if you don't speak the local language. Hope that helps. Um, Michael asks, how do you afford such great trips? Um, 
that's a very flattering uh, question because I do think that these are some phenomenal trips. Um, I will say that working in the travel industry does help. Um, I do get some preferential rates, but it's not always free. And so I think the answer to this question is actually that I make it a priority. And this is a really, um, I think, important concept to to emphasize here is that um I, you know i've worked with people who go to africa on an amazing safari who don't make an exceptionally huge salary but they budget travel into their lifestyle just as they would rent or mortgage their insurance their groceries and travel so it's just an annual expense and they look at it as an investment rather than an, ex and an expense so i guess kind of changing the, the the mind shift and getting into the frame of mind of thinking like you know, thinking of it as an investment and making it a priority too. Um, and then in terms of like budgeting for that, setting money aside, um, I could actually link to a blog here from a friend of mine who is a professional financial planner. And she has some great tips on making these sort of bucket list type trips into a reality for the average person. Because the truth of the matter is that it's not always um, impossible to get to these really far flung, beautiful destinations. It just takes a little bit of planning and some prioritization. Um, <laughs> Susan, thanks for the comment on my nice tan. <laughs> uh, we're, <laughs> we're pretty close to the equator, so I've gotten some sun. Uh, <laughs> Tayani asks, uh, how do you research or prepare for finding great places to eat where you go? Is there a way to find great local spots, or is it truly just luck? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it takes a delicate balance of pre-planning and doing your research of places you really want to hit up and also leaving yourself enough flexibility so that when you get down to the destination and you're gonna find some awesome places to eat at um, to kind of build in that flexibility as well. So um, when I am preparing for a trip, um, food is such a huge thing in, in any city, in any part of the world. And um, one of the things that I find frustrating is TripAdvisor actually, because you know people will go on, they'll leave reviews, um, but I don't think that TripAdvisor is like the place that I would personally go to for restaurant recommendations. What I'll do is actually Google like the name of the city or the country where I'm at or where I'm planning on going and then type like food blog. So if I'm in Cusco, I'll type in Cusco food blog. And then there you can get people who are really knowledgeable about the food scene in Cusco, Peru, who are going to be leaving reviews, who have links to articles. And so I think in, in food bloggers too, food journalists, so having like true expert opinions on where you should go rather than somebody from, you know, the middle of nowhere in the U.S. who just doesn't really have the same tastes as you. Um, I think that Googling, you know, this, the city or country where you're traveling to and then, um, you know, food blog or, or best restaurants or something like that, you'll get a whole list. Um, in terms of like the small little places that aren't necessarily going to be on the food blogs, there's no better way than word of mouth. And so finding those local people, whether you're in a coffee shop or if you um, are just, you know, finding people who look like you or like look like the style of um, eater that you would be, um, if, whether that's adventurous or if you're looking for something a little bit more westernized. Um, really, there's no better way than to talk to the local people. And like I said, it could be in a coffee shop. It could be in a restaurant setting. Um, it could be even, you know, just somebody that um, you see sitting at a coffee shop that looks like somebody that you would probably want to have dinner with. They might have some good suggestions as well for you. So um, I think it's sort of maybe putting yourself out there and um, trying to strike up a conversation with the local and asking like, hey, where do you go with your family or where would you want to have an amazing dinner um, or, you know, if you, if you go to the markets, actually in Cusco, for example, I'll use this as a great example. A lot of the vendors, um, for restaurants or purveyors from restaurants will go there and they'll actually source product from the local farmers and the, you know, the cheese makers and things. And so if you want to talk to somebody who's actually a farmer or a vendor, you can say like, do you sell to any restaurants? And then, um, see if they have wholesale, you know, distribution through the restaurants there. And so, um, you can oftentimes find some fantastic restaurants that way, especially those kind of like small little holes in the wall. Um, let's see. Andre says, what are some of the cities or countries that you recommend we go to soon before they become discovered and become tourist filled? Wow, that is a really, really great question. Um, I think it's maybe, I'm trying to think how to phrase this because I think that um, on the one hand, some of the most spectacular places 
are spectacular and touristy for a reason because they're so amazing. But I would say, um, I mean, you could find tons of lists. I mean, I'll go to like Travel and Leisure. I do a lot of reading on Recommend Magazine. Um, and so they'll have lists. And again, like I try to kind of stay away from lists because who knows like what criteria they're using. Um, but I would recommend, I mean, like I think Iceland is super hot right now, but it's still um, not quite as touristy as, you know, so many other places, especially in Europe. Like I'm personally, I'm not like a huge fan of crowds as well. So I'm going to avoid places like the big cities like Rome and even just all throughout Europe. Um, but I think like, if you look at places that are super touristy and then oftentimes places that are adjacent to them are not quite as touristy, but they uh, oftentimes have the same characteristics of greatness as, um, the country next door that is more popular. I'll use again, the Peru example, just because I'm here and is on top of my mind. Um, if you consider, if you're, if you're wanting to come to Peru and you think that like, say Machu Picchu is too overcrowded, it's very crowded, but it's an amazing experience and would highly recommend going. Why not consider Ecuador to the North? It's, you know, a hop, skip and a jump away. It's not too far. And it's incredibly rich in diversity and so many different experiences, amazing food for all the same reasons that you're going to love Peru. You'd probably love Ecuador and they have Inca ruins. They have the same type of biodiversity. So I would look at like adjacent countries or places to wherever it is that you're going. If you think that Thailand is overcrowded, maybe you want to consider heading to Burma or Myanmar, which is adjacent to it. It's becoming a very like um, up and coming destination, despite the political kind of upheaval there. Um, you may also consider Cambodia or Vietnam or Laos if for example, Thailand is too busy for your taste. So I would kind of look in the general area of wherever it is that you're wanting to go. And if you think it's too touristy, look kind of in the vicinity and see if you can find anything that would have a similar flavor, um, but maybe less touristy and therefore sometimes less expensive as well. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you for that question, by the way, Andre. That's awesome. Um, Corey asks, what is the real value added by a travel agent when they have the interwebs? Uh, I love this question because I'm biased, but I'm going to give you my honest opinion on this because it's the truth. Travel agents and travel professionals, I kind of bristled the term travel agent, but it is what it is. Um, travel agents really do have the local contacts. And so we're certain types of travel agents, I should, I should say. So when you talk to a travel professional, be sure to ask like if they've been to the destination, what are their um, the philosophies on sort of like responsible travel. Um, but the, the basic premise of using a travel professional is that we have the contacts and the connections that the average person doesn't. And um, I say that not to be arrogant, but I say that because it's true. I've just been spending the last four months here in South America building really strong personal relationships and with my suppliers who are here on site. They've, they, they live it. They breathe it. They've grown up in it. And, um, you know, these, these suppliers of mine have actually become personal friends in many cases. I'll actually go hiking with them and hang out. And I'm heading to Ecuador later this week to see my Ecuadorian supplier, who is a good friend of mine. So... Being able to um, have somebody here on the ground who is super knowledgeable about the destination and can make recommendations tailored to your specific needs. Um, because if you're using a guidebook, and you know, when I was younger, I would use photos and I would use Lonely Planet, and I think they're okay for like forming a loose, bare bones trip. But I'll say that for one, um, if you're using the guidebooks, then you're going to the same exact tourist places as all the hundreds of thousands of other people who have bought that same guidebook are going. And to me, that doesn't fly. Um, and I'll also say that using a travel professional gives you a higher caliber of guide and of experience. And so I'll use the example of the Galapagos. I was talking to a woman from Ireland and I said, you know, how was your, how was your trip to the Galapagos? And she says, eh, I was a little bit underwhelmed. And I was thinking, oh my God, how can you be underwhelmed in the Galapagos? This is one of the most spectacular places on earth. She had done it herself and she had gone through a couple of like those like rinky dink um, travel agencies on like when she finally got to land and wanted to do, to do these day tours. And that is so like not the way to see the Galapagos. You really want to talk to a travel professional who can arrange for the highest quality guides, the best experience to take you to places that you couldn't even have access to. 
um, otherwise. I mean, some of these small vessels, if you don't know any better, you don't know any better. But some of these sm small vessels in the Galapagos, for example, can only go in certain places and they have to be crowded with a bunch of other small vessels. But if you talk to the right travel professional and you get on the right cruise, you can actually go way out in the uh, outer islands. You can see places that other travel companies literally are not allowed to see. So I will say that um, just having that, that um, extra experience, the better experience in some of these places just makes all the difference in the world. Um, also just having the time savings too. I've worked with people who just, they love to travel. They're, they're very well-traveled. Um, they just simply don't have the time to plan out all the pieces of their trip in a way that makes them comfortable. And so having a travel professional to be able to take on that, that responsibility for you and to present customized options, I think is really appealing as well. Um, you know, I think there's a stigma too of using a travel agent of is kind of being like old fashioned. Um, and that people say that the travel agent industry is dying and that we no longer exist. But the fact of the matter is that's not really true. <laughs> We're just doing it better. Um, in fact, I'm here in the sacred Valley of Peru at a place called Sol y Luna, and it's an amazing little property. I'm here to do site inspections, not only just in this hotel, but for about seven or eight different properties here in the sacred Valley. So that when I have a client that comes to me, I'm not pushing the hotels that I want to sell, but I'm making recommendations of hotels that I think are the personal best for their particular needs and the desires and their budget. And so um, I think having that person who is an expert, whether it's the travel professional themselves or my on-site suppliers, who is there to be your, your, your ally and to make recommendations specific for you rather than having to go through like TripAdvisor and Yelp and Lonely Planet. I just feel like that's so much extra work and for, for what, for less quality? No thanks. Um, and I will say that um, just kind of a little side note here in terms of like travel professionals and using a travel agent, it really doesn't cost extra for what you're getting because um, a lot of times people think that travel professionals are compensated by adding an additional commission on top of it. But what, how I actually describe it is that travel professionals are generally compensated by subtracting the commission from the base rate. So you're not paying any more. It's just that the hotels are making less. Uh, <laughs> but you're getting a better experience. And when, so, when something goes wrong or you really need an advocate to go to bat for you, having a tra travel professional um, there when things go wrong, I think, makes all the difference in the world, too. And um, it's, it's a rare circumstance where that happens. But when it does happen, and it, it does happen, um, you're going to want to have an advocate on your side, whether you have a delayed flight, um, maybe the hotel doesn't have the room that you had requested first. Um, it could be any number of little things, or it could be something as significant as like a pipe bursting or who has the local connections that um, the average person doesn't will be really beneficial when you're, <laughs> when you're trying to get um, anything taken care of or resolved. Um, Christopher Reistroffer, as you, you say, how is the currency exchange where you're at? Food, entertainment, et cetera. That's a really great question. Um, and it really depends on where you're going. So I'm here in Peru, which is a relatively affordable destination. Really wonderful quality experience. I love Peru. I think it's been an amazing value. And um, down here we use the soul, the, the soul. And um, to put that in context, about three soles equals one U.S. dollar, so 33 cents per sole. Um, I find it very uh, affordable. I will say, though, that um, in terms of, like, budgeting, huh, it can sky's the limit depending on where you are, and that's true of pretty much any destination around the world. Um, in Peru, um, I mean, I'm just thinking of like activities, food, hotel, et cetera. I don't even want to throw a dollar amount out there just because it could vary so greatly depending on where you are and the time of year that you go. But like 25 to 50% on top of that, just because there are going to be things that sprout up that you're going to want to either splurge on a really nice meal, you're going to want to splurge on the best come down or on, before you go on your way back to the U.S., you might want to splurge on a nice hotel to kind of just like decompress or take a nice hot shower or just kind of 
enjoy a little bit more of a luxury experience. And um, one, of the th- one of the things that I do actually with my clients, if they're looking to cut corners, I ask them, I'm just like, where would you want to, like, are you, if you're not comfortable with the budget, what would you want to cut? And generally speaking, it's interesting because sometimes people will cut the wrong things. And it's part of my job as a travel professional to kind of steer them and say, actually, like, this is what I would recommend. This is where I would cut corners if it were me personally. One of the one of the benefits um, back to Corey's question that um, I think this is an important thing too. When clients have honesty about their budgets, you've got to be decide where you should be. You know, slashing the budget you should splurge and spend a little bit of extra money. So. Say Peru is probably middle of the road in terms of cost of travel. Um, I'm gonna crazy expensive, especially compared to Peru. Um, Africa is very expensive as well. For Asia, you're probably going to be a lot less in certain. But um, I know like Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, so just be realistic about your budget and then tack on. Do you recommend um, cutting some of the corners and then we can work from you, with you um, from there. And it's like what you want to see and what you want to do. Um, but those are. So I hope that answers your question, Chris. Um, and I'm going to call. for choosing a destination. And this is it depends on your budget, what you want to see, what you want to do and experience, and of course where you live too. So Monica But um as I had mentioned with um Aaron's um get around, but um see or do and then creating a list based off of that you want to do go there do that right hundred dollars here and there so pick a place kind of synthesize all of your desires about what it is that you what what you want to do in your rest interests you want to do do you want to go on a hot air balloon do you want to go the priorities that you want to have for your vacation but Overall, I think to answer your question and to stop rambling, um, I would say to make a list of, you know, just focus on one destination at a time. You can also locate it in complex based off of like food and a plan for the next three, four, five years, and then work toward getting you there. So on this, um, probably make these into some blog topics.